Over the last couple of weeks, we have been reminded from the opening verses of Peter's letter to the churches and Christians in Asia Minor that our only hope is Jesus. And what a reminder that is in these uncertain days. It's a reminder that every single one of us needs. Because we are tempted to place our hope in other places. But as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must always remember that our only hope is Jesus. Amen. All of that sounds nice when you're listening to a sermon. If you've been following Jesus for any length of time, you know that our only hope is Jesus. But what does it look like to live in light of that reality? I mean, what do I do? How can I hope in Jesus as I'm going through my life, as I'm experiencing the circumstances and the difficulties and the challenges that come about? How do I hope in Jesus? Well, I think Peter knew that the Christians in Asia Minor would be asking those questions. And so he provided some answers in this next section of the letter. And so this morning, as we look again at 1 Peter 1, I want to read for you verses 13 through 21. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Peter writes this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Would you pray with me? And Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for inspiring Peter by your Holy Spirit to record these words. And we thank you for preserving these words for 2,000 years now, that we, on this day, this, this time, that we could come together and consider these words and hear your truth together as your people. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us this morning, give us ears to hear, conform us more and more to the image of your Son, Jesus, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. amen. As we move through this text this morning, I want to show you three ways to hope in Jesus. Three ways that you, as a follower of Jesus, can hope in Jesus. And the first way that I would exhort you from God's Word this morning to hope in Jesus is to hope in Jesus by setting your mind on Jesus. Hope in Jesus by setting your mind on Jesus. Peter writes in verse 13, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As we think about the salvation that we have in Jesus, we are reminded this morning that our salvation has not yet been fully realized. We are reminded this morning that we still live in sinful bodies in a sinful world. We are reminded that things are not yet as they should be. That we are not yet as we will be. But there is coming a day, Goshen, and at the revelation of Jesus Christ, when He will complete His work in us, we will be given glorified bodies. We will be raised to sin no more. 
And we will live forever with the Lord Jesus Christ in a new heaven and in a new earth. Friends, that's what Peter is talking about here. And he says to set your hope fully on it. If we're honest with ourselves, we'd have to admit that that's easier said than done. That there are so many things in this world that compete for our attention. And the reality is that many of the things that compete for our attention in this world are actually good things. Family, work, vacation, and, and many other good things that we can think about that compete for our attention. But Peter says to us this morning, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, maybe at this point of the sermon you're starting to think that that's still a bit ambiguous. I mean, what does it mean for me to set my hope in Jesus? How do I do that? What does that look like for me as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the good news is that Peter answers that question. He says that you must prepare your mind for action. Look again at the beginning of verse 13. He says, therefore, preparing your minds for action. Some translations translate this phrase as a command. The New American Standard Bible says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. But understand that this is not a separate command. It is part of setting your hope fully on Jesus. And so if we change the word order a bit to get at what Peter is saying here, we might translate it, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ by preparing your minds for action. Which then raises the question, what does it mean for me to prepare my mind for action? I think the idea that Peter is getting at here is that if we're going to hope in Jesus, we're going to have to be disciplined in our thinking. Hey, if we're going to hope in Jesus, we're going to have to be disciplined in our thinking. You're not going to accidentally set your hope on Jesus. It's not going to happen by accident. No, you'll accidentally set your hope on your work. You'll accidentally set your hope on your pocketbook. You accidentally set your hope on a nice house or a nice car. You accidentally set your hope on good health. But if you're going to set your hope on Jesus, if you're going to set your hope on eternity, if you're going to set your hope on something that's not now seen, it's going to have to be intentional. It's going to require focus. It's going to require discipline. And as followers of Jesus, we have to discipline our minds to set our hope on Him. The next thing that Peter says you must do if you're going to set your hope in Jesus is you must be sober-minded. You must be sober-minded. Peter writes there in verse 13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. I like what Tom Schreiner says here when he writes, There is a way of living that becomes dull to the reality of God, that is anesthetized by the attractions of this world. When people are lulled into such drowsiness, they lose sight of Christ's future revelation of Himself and concentrate only on fulfilling their earthly desires. Goshen, this is one of the great benefits of us coming together, gathering as the people of God. We gather each week to come together and to collectively, as God's people, set our hope on Jesus. Throughout the week, there are so many things that are competing for our attention. And if we don't have something that's going to draw us back in, I want you to know that we will lose focus. We'll get off track. We'll find that our true hope is in a thousand different things other than Jesus. And so we come here on Sunday morning, and it's kind of like a pep rally. It helps us get ready for the big game. 
It helps us to focus on what really matters so that we can go out there during the week and we can live for Jesus. So number one, hope in Jesus by setting your mind on Jesus. Number two, hope in Jesus by pursuing a life of holiness. Hope in Jesus by pursuing a life of holiness. Look at verse 15. Peter writes there, Be holy in all your conduct. Be holy in all your conduct. You see, to be holy is to be set apart. Set apart from sin and set apart for God. We've already said that you can't hope in Jesus if you're distracted by the good things that this world has to offer. Like family and work and vacation. But if that's true, how much more is it true that you can't hope in Jesus if you're distracted by sin? You can't continue in sin and assume that you won't be affected by it. It really doesn't matter what the sin is. Sin messes with our affections. Consider drunkenness. You can't set your hope in Jesus if you're consumed with your next drink. Consider sexual sin, whether it be pornography or fornication or adultery. You can't set your hope in Jesus if you're consumed with gratifying the desires of your flesh. Consider a sin that we might think of as more harmless, like pride. When you're prideful, you're consumed with yourself. And you can't set your hope in Jesus if you're consumed with yourself. What about neglecting Bible reading and prayer? How can you say that you're setting your hope in Jesus if you're never spending time with Him in His Word through prayer? The truth is that if you're going to set your hope in Jesus, you must pursue a life of holiness. You must seek to be holy in all your conduct. Because God, as God's children, we don't live as we once did. Look at verse 14. Peter writes there, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. You remember in verse 4, Peter referred to our inheritance. Who gets an inheritance? Usually it's the children, right? Brothers and sisters, we have been adopted as children of God made possible by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as God's children, we don't think like we once thought. We don't live like we once lived. We don't do the things that we once did. No, we are new creations in Christ Jesus. And so we do not conform ourselves to the passions of our former ignorance. We live as the new people that we are in Jesus. All of us can look back on our lives and see a lot of stupid in our past, right? Some of us can see more stupid than others. But nothing was more stupid than our rejection of Jesus and our attempt to go our own way and do our own thing. But if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to know that's over now. Because we are obedient children of God. And notice that the pattern for our holiness is God. Look at verse 15, Peter writes, But as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. There is no one who is holier than God. He is holy, holy, holy. And He has revealed His holiness in His Word. The quotation in verse 16 comes from the law of God in Leviticus. And we see something similar to that in several places in Leviticus. See, sometimes people think that the Bible is just a list of rules that God likes. That God is this cosmic killjoy who just likes to take away our fun. No, 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 no. Understand, Goshen, that the law of God is a reflection of His holy character. The law of God tells us what our God is like. And so when we obey His Word, we are reflecting His character. You'll remember that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. 
He lived a life of perfect obedience to God. And in His perfect life, He is our example. And I don't know about you, but I want to love like Jesus loved. I want to show mercy like Jesus showed mercy. I want to walk in humility like Jesus walked in humility. I want to be patient like Jesus was patient. I want to be kind like Jesus was kind. I want to be faithful like Jesus was faithful. I want to flee from sin like Jesus fled from sin when He looked the devil in the eye and said, You shall worship the Lord your God and Him only shall you serve. Can you see how pursuing holiness causes us to look like Jesus? To look to Jesus? To set our hope in Him? To see Him as our example and to see Him as the one who will one day make us holy. Because brothers and sisters, we're still struggling against sin, aren't we? This process of pursuing holiness isn't going to be completed in this life. But there is coming a day when Jesus will complete the process. And we look forward to that day. And as we pursue holiness, as we struggle with sin, as we fight against our flesh, we look to Jesus. We set our hope in Him. If you want to hope in Jesus, you've got to pursue a life of holiness. And number three, hope in Jesus by fearing God, not man. Hope in Jesus by fearing God, not man. Look at verse 17. 17. Peter writes, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Now this instruction may seem strange at first. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 1 John 4:18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. No doubt there is a kind of fear that the Bible condemns. But we see here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, that there is also a kind of fear that is good and right. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus said, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear Him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So you see, there is a kind of fear that the Bible condemns, but there is also a kind of fear that the Bible commends. It is the fear of the Lord. And I want you to know this morning that it is good and right to fear God. Why? Because God is both our Father and our Judge. Look at verse 17 again. Peter writes, And if you call on Him as Father... Conduct yourselves with fear. Let me ask you, is there a healthy fear that a child should have of his or her father? I think we know that the answer is yes. Not a fear where the child is terrified of his father, but a fear where the child respects his father. I don't want my children to be afraid of me, but I do want them to respect me. I want them to know that when I say do this or don't do this, I mean business. And if you don't obey, you're going to be disciplined. Why? Because I love my children. I want them to grow up to be productive citizens. I want them to learn to uh, proper respect for authority. But most importantly, I want to give them instructions that align with what God says in His Word because ultimately, I want them to learn to obey God. You see, God is a good Father. A good Father who expects obedience from His children. And there is a healthy fear that we should have of God. Because not only is He our Father, He is also our Judge. Look again at verse 17. Peter writes, And if you call on Him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear. You see, God is not only our Father, He is our Judge. 
And we will one day give an account to God for the way that we live our lives. And if we've got our minds set on Jesus, if we're looking toward eternity, understand that we're going to live in light of this coming judgment. Not because we're terrified of God. You see, I'm not afraid of the judge down at the courthouse. But I don't want to enter his courtroom when I've been caught breaking a law. I have a healthy fear of the judge down at the courthouse. And in the same way, we should have a healthy fear of God. Now, before we move on, I want to draw your attention to a word there in verse 17 that stands out to me. It's the word impartially. God judges impartially. Equal justice under the law has been a big focus over the last week and a half or so. And as followers of Jesus, we should be people who stand for justice. Because our God is a God of justice. Our Pledge of Allegiance says justice for all. That is the ideal that we strive for as Americans, but Goshen especially as Christians. But we know that in a fallen world, it doesn't always work that way, does it? Sometimes justice isn't served because there's not enough evidence. Sometimes justice isn't served because there's a corrupt prosecutor or judge. Sometimes justice isn't served because the defendant has a lot of money. Sometimes justice isn't served because of bias or prejudice. There's an infinite number of reasons that justice may not be served in a fallen world. And as people who understand sin and understand the depravity of man, we of all people should be able to understand that. But I want to tell you this morning that God isn't like that at all. He judges impartially. When He makes His judgment on the last day, He won't be missing any evidence. He won't be swayed by corruption because He is the righteous judge. Amen. He can't be bought and He has no bias or prejudice. All of His judgments are right. And that's good news for us. It's good news for us to know that we won't be held accountable for something we didn't do. But it should also cause us to fear God in a healthy way because we know that there's not anything we can hide from God. We can hide our sin from our brothers and sisters in Christ. Sometimes I think we can even hide our sin from ourselves. But understand this, we can never hide our sin from God. We will be kept held accountable for everything. Peter says, according to to each one's deeds. Peter then returns to God's saving work in us. I love this because the focus of verses 1 through 12 was God's saving work. The focus of verses 13 through 17 was how we live as followers of Jesus in light of God's saving work. And now in verses 18 to 21, our attention is turned again to God's saving work in us. Look beginning in verse 18. Peter says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through Him are believers in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. You see, as followers of Jesus, we've been ransomed out of our sin and feudal living with the precious blood of Jesus. And this was God's plan from eternity past. God knew that you would sin. God knew that you would rebel against Him. And He determined in eternity past to send His Son Jesus to die in your place and to pay for your sin. Because of Jesus, we've been brought into a right relationship with God. Peter says we are believers in God. And I wonder this morning, what about you? 
You see, we've been talking about hope in Jesus this morning. We've been talking about the reality that the only way to have hope in Jesus is to surrender your life to Him. And I wonder this morning, has there been a time in your life where you first turned from your sin and placed your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Where you surrendered yourself to Him? Where you recognized your sin and how your sin separates you from a holy God? And where you confessed your sin to God and you placed your trust in Jesus. Has that happened in your life? But not only has there been a time in your life where that happened, but are you right now trusting Jesus as your Savior? Are you right now even striving to flee from sin and trust in Jesus as your only hope of being right with God and one day gaining entrance into heaven? Are you trusting Jesus today because I want you to know that the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead Paul writes you will be saved salvation is in is only in the Lord Jesus Christ if you would repent of your sin and place your trust in him we've seen that we Hope in Jesus by setting our minds on Him, by pursuing a life of holiness, by fearing God and not man. But as we think on those things this week, may we, may we learn to put these things into practice. And may we, as God's people, determine that we will set our hope not in anything else, not our circumstances, not our difficulties, not our challenges, not anyone else, but only in Jesus. Amen. Because our only hope is Jesus.